I, you can hear me, I suppose, yeah? Um, I think that uh, this attempt to create kind of a policy for representation of Holocaust and Memorial Center, Seinstebe, City of Belgrade, unfortunately had a very short period of life because the committee was abolished a year ago with the change of government. Now there, there is a, a new attempt to recreate a committee, but of course some of the people will not like to join this kind of, uh, let's say, memorial policy. I, however, accept it to stay in this new uh, body, which is not yet created. That also is significant that it obviously takes a lot of time. It takes one day to abolish something, and then it takes a lot of months to create a new body who will be in charge for memorial policy of uh, old fair in Belgrade. For us, what was extremely important first was to discuss why politics of forgetting and different types of forgetting regarding old tale in Belgrade. And I wanted to remind you on Connerton text of seven types of forgetting, why and how society forgets. And regarding old tale in Belgrade, I think his seven types are not sufficient. There is one more type of forgetting which he somehow forgot to mention, which is shameful silence. If the society has feeling of guilt and shame, then it tends to forget things for which the society is shameful about. Then another issue is also very important to rediscuss uh, prior to defining or trying to define policies of representation of Holocaust and memorial site in Staro Sajdeshne. It's exactly a new urban policies of urban regeneration and reuse which puts pressure on city governments to make, um, let's say, spectacular sites, sites which are going to fit so-called creative cities policy so that reuse of old places, spaces, not only post-industrial but post-whatever, should be somehow linked to new prospects of city development. And that's exactly something we would like to counterpict and to fight against this kind of policies of reuse. Uh, then, of course, there is, uh, besides policies of forgetting, there is also types, different types of policy of remembrance. What is, in fact, desirable collective memory? And are we now, this program committee, the one who will create a new type of desired politics of memory, politics of remembrance, and how to prevent ourselves to enter in a kind of, um, I would say, discourse which is consensual, which is fitting, which can, uh, uh, which can bring a consensus of different social partners. Because in one side, yes, it is important to have participative policy making, to have, to involve as many agents, social agents and actors as possible, okay, uh, in this debate. But at the same time, it would be extremely risky and uh, not really desirable if the aim would be achieving a consensus, because it is achieving a Census, the historical truth uh, will be probably totally destroyed. Anyway, our uh, committee, program committee for Memorial Center, was working for a year, and on the basis exactly of Jovan Weiton's paper, we have developed, let's say, 15 points, <laughs> which we thought should be the base for the decisions, political decisions, about creation of new memorial sites. First decision, or first our, all, all of that are our propositions, is that the memorial <coughs> center should encompass the whole territory of old fair of uh, Sajnište. So not only in this moment the city disposes only with three buildings, but uh, the tower, the garden, the pavilion, but the memorial center should be enlarged 
on the old space which was uh, uh, which was part of the Jürgen Memoir, which was part of this old fair. Then taking in account the importance of uh, facts happening there, uh, Memorial Center should first present Holocaust as historical event and unique destiny of Jewish population of Belgrade. Uh, so this and because of that, to the Holocaust should be devoted a specific organizational and programmatic department of this memorial center. The third element was consisting what should be the program policy, not only dealing with the past, but also being actively involved in fighting contemporary anti-Semitism, anti-Romanism, but also any sorts and any uh, elements of racism. The Memorial Center, of course, should have, let's say, at least three to four basic departments. Exhibition department, educational department, but also research and documentation. And all three, although should be separate departments, they, they should and they have to act in, a, let's say, mutually interactive way to feel one another, to uh, create a space where uh, the contemporary uh, cultural, let's say, life, uh, research, scientific, and cultural should be integrated and uh, should give, um, I would say, the profound and complex picture of historical events happening there. The fifth point was relating to necessary European, uh, let's say, linking and networking. We thought that this memorial center has to be linked uh, with all other similar institutions that be part of certain memorial networks which exist in today's Europe. But uh, in the same time, we uh, have to focus or the, uh, the key issue was how to represent, which kind of exhibiting should be the best one. And we thought that was uh, absolutely agreed that the exhibition uh, display should be mostly involved involving new technologies, multimedia approach. Why? Because then it's not only documents and artifacts which could be exhibited, but first of all, video testimonies, for example, everything collected through oral history approach and also different films, documentary, but even pictures. So everything which could be important material to provoke uh, understanding and adequate interpretation of the happenings. Even the, the whole space, it shouldn't be only exhibition inside the buildings, but also within the whole space, within the old public space of the memorial, memorial sites. Definitely uh, that in the choice, in selection of all those materials, what should be protected is the dignity of the victims and uh, to, but also to protect sensitivity of visitors of different generation of visitors because of course that uh, memorial site should be at the same time educational site aiming to attract uh, different gener generation from the youngest one to the oldest one visitors. There are also uh, many other elements which might be interesting and maybe uh, always going to speak more about it. To what extent in this place, this memorial site have to collect artifacts and souvenirs also, not only of uh, old fair memorial site, but and only about uh, vic vic Jewish victims during uh, or in the space of maybe Serbia, but also in Vojvodina, also in Kosovo and in the eastern Serbia period, uh, period region, but also it has to include not only uh, stories of the victims, but also stories of those who have been saving or uh, uh, those who have shown extreme courage in uh, uh, individual courage and uh, um, trying to, to, to save. Uh, Jewish 
persons of Jewish origin during the Second World War. At the same time, we can say, yes, there, there was a lot of debate how, besides this uh, sending Angel Lager, uh, how we can keep other types of memories. Even 10 years ago, when we had another debate about all there in Belgrade, I was among those who were speaking about this multi-layered memory and many different uh, types of memories which are linked to this site. But what to prioritize and how, however, to bring the story of what it used to be before Second World War and what this old fair meant with all these pavilions built for industrial show. How it, in a certain way, represented, yes, modern architecture, but also coming fascism with its very important Italian or German pavilion. And what happened after Second World War, how that to integrate, how to integrate life of working brigades who have been put there, and then artistic center. Uh, what, uh, in what extent all these different elements of history should be and how should be integrated in this, let's say, display and representation. But uh, we stood up as a program committee that the major attention and the major line should be, in fact, representation of Holocaust and representation of uh, other victims and the um, activities of the lager due after that, after, uh, during Second, Second World War, so that it has to be represented also destiny of people brought from Kozera, from independent state of Croatia, etc. Uh, there are many other issues which might be, I would say, debated that, uh, and which should be, uh, I would say, should represent a big issue when the final is selection of artifacts, selection of the major line of the exhibition uh, had to be defined. But uh, I would say that this text exactly was aiming to create to, or to fight for a new culture of memory, a uh, new culture of memory regarding both old fair in Belgrade and the Holocaust memory in Serbia, because in spite of the whole, even in the period of anti, uh, in the period of socialism, where anti-fascism was part of the main and official politics, Holocaust memory somehow didn't have the place which should have and which have in other European countries today. We have not had a really well done educational research, memorial, institution which will uh, connect or which will brought uh, and uh, uh, link toward wider population. Although we had a lot of memorial sites linked Second World War throughout ex Yugoslavia. But those memorial sites didn't have, in this extent, which is necessary, educational research and interpretative role which would uh, make it really uh, places of memory which uh, keep not only memory but which are involved in contemporary processes of reflection, creativity, research, and conceptualization of problem. In this sense, I would say that using this Connerton typology about prescriptive forgetting, was it really to think, I would like to, to invite debate on this. I don't think that neglection of old fair in Belgrade was part of a repressive erasure. Nobody was forbidding it to be remembered. But it was kind of prescriptive forgetting. Let's forget what was happening just to build new brotherhood unity, new country, new socialism, and so on. It was not even, according to this typology, a necessity for a new identity. No, of course not, because in that time, especially during socialist Yugoslavia, this could be exactly very to remember what was happening on Old Fair could be exactly part of that time built identity. Forgetting as humiliated silence, maybe, 
but I doubt that also. For me, it's mostly part of this shameful silence. We don't want to be reminded about laws which were brought even before Second World War regarding Jewish population. And that definitely has to be, to understand what happened and why that was not many reaction in public opinion. We have to understand what was the atmosphere and what were the conditions before Second World War and why anti-Jewish law, anti-Semitic law could be accepted without much public debate even before, not to speak, under the German, German occupation. So I can say also, and I will finish with this, I think that Till today, what was also type of forgetting was type of confused silence. We didn't know what really to remember and why, and should we remember, uh, and to what extent. So much easier it is to put in oblivion many uh, difficult facts uh, in order not to force ourselves to understand the real causes of anti-Semitism in Serbia, for example, and um, many other issues which are happening even today regarding uh, uh, acceptance of, uh, I would say, even fascistic idea uh, or uh, uh, sending anti-fascism in oblivion as part of the public, official public policies. Of course, in the last few days we can see now some changes regarding new celebrations of the liberation of Belgrade, which might represent kind of a good sign, but at the same time we are all aware that it's also part of the international, in this case, uh, Russian pressure for uh, one kind of approach to liberation of Belgrade interpretation. Uh, that would be my part of the program. Thank you very much. Olga? Well, uh, I will say a few words about commemorations of um, the Holocaust during the socialist period, but at the beginning I just want to add something uh, that deals with the work of the Commission about which uh, Milena was talking, just maybe some clarifications which uh, I think are very important. I wanted to say that during the last decade there were several uh, private initiatives and research, then uh, some NGOs initiatives and research, and also some cultural institutions uh, of the city that were dealing with the problems of uh, the heavy heritage of the concentration camp uh, old fair here in Belgrade. They were at the margin of the public interest, but I think it is important to mention them because sometimes the margin is reflecting the center even better than it is expected. So the idea of this commission was to bring together people from different institutions, people from Jewish community, uh, um, people from academic community, uh, activists and artists who were dealing with the topic of Staro Sajmište. Unfortunately, not all of those who were dealing with that topic were included in the commission. But uh, during those few months, uh, I think the dialogue was established and the final document about which Milena was talking represents a kind of a uh, compromise and uh, no matter a uh, very precise document defining what should be the uh, main uh, content of the program of the future exhibition. And in that respect I want to add uh, to stress that in the first article of that uh, document we should say, it is stressed that Memorial Center Old Fair Ground as a newly established institution of culture, should, as Milena said, uh, include the whole space, which was defined as such by the decision of the city government in 1987, when the idea on the establishment of the memorial 
con uh, Gestapo camp called Fairground was defined. And what is the most important, that this memorial center should be dedicated to the victims of the camp, which were uh, abused and killed uh, due because of their national uh, uh, national belonging, <laughs> patriotism, or um, their attempt to uh, confront a uh, brutal regime of the occupation and their collaborators. And the main uh, role of the center must be uh, to not to, man, uh, to deal with the space of the fairground, but to deal with the specific phase of its existence, the phase when it was concentration camp. And that the main, as it is uh, written here in the second uh, part, uh, that um, the main goal of this uh, whole memorial is to stress and to define the, 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 the destiny and the suffering of the Jewish community from the territory of Serbia. So I wanted to say that the main intention of the commission was to present the history and the existence of the concentration camp in both phases of its existence, but in the same time having in mind that in Serbia, there are exi existing museum of the genocide here in Belgrade and also the one in uh, Kragujevac. The main interest of this community and the main interest of the Serbia as a state is to adequately uh, 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 commemorate and memorialize and discuss the problem of the Holocaust on the Serbian territory. So that, is, that was the main uh, our idea. And in the same time, to include that in the whole history and the whole period of the existence of the, the, the concentration camp. So, uh, I think that this, what happened, and those 15 points that were defined by the Commission, were finally something that was officially uh, defined on the level of the town, of the city of Belgrade. Although uh, it is very important to stress that uh, uh, some of those initiatives were started in the 1980s when uh, uh, the official discourse which was established during the period of socialist Yugoslavia, which was mainly uh, commemorating the anti-fascist struggle and the victims of the fascism on the territory of Yugoslavia was dedicated to those places where the victims were killed and there were the places where the monuments were established and also memorial sites to places of the great battles of the Second World War and people liberation struggle and also in the city, in the urban space that was decision which was especially during 80s promoted to commemorate by uh, certain plaques in the city places of anti-fascist struggle and uh, sometimes they were commemorated in a form of monuments and sometimes those graffitis which were found and re-established on the city walls and on the buildings they were the one which were re in a special way uh, shown in the public. So among those activities, the uh, space of uh, Yainzi was in 1988. Uh, it is not very proper word, redesigned, but it was uh, redone in a new way with some new um, intervention in the space which was established as a memorial park even during 1950s. And then, uh, in 1984, the space of old fairground during the time when Bogdan Bogdanovich was a mayor was marked by that uh, plaque which was uh, 
built in the center of the fairground. Although the old plaque was there established for the first time in 1974. So um, these were those first attempts which were somehow uh, finally defined in 1987 when the decision was uh, brought that there should be a memorial center. Uh, however, during the 1990s, all those initiatives were forgotten. And uh, although in 1995 the monument was uh, erected at the bank of River Sava, the monument to the victims of genocide when the 50 years of the end of the Second World War was established, that monument was not in any communication with the space of uh, the uh, fairground. And uh, it was in that moment mostly perceived as a monument to the victims of uh, Serbian victims of genocide in the independent state of Croatia. It was 1995 year of the atrocities in Croatia and Bosnia, and certainly was not perceived and presented as a very important monument explaining the uh, history of that space and history of the largest. Uh, concentration camp on Serbian territory during the Second World War and one of the uh, most important concentration camp in the region during the same period. Uh, I have to say here, because uh, I was dealing uh, with the ways of representation of the Holocaust in the public space during the socialism, that uh, all of these initiatives were started during 1980s, uh, Jovan was also writing, he can uh, say something about that. But in 1952, we, uh, yesterday Nadev was also talking about that, uh, there were some very important actions in the public space of uh, socialist Yugoslavia that were specifically marking the Holocaust and Jewish victims of the Second World War on Yugoslav territory. This was the time, the year, when the biggest uh, aliyah was organized and the biggest uh, number of Jewish population from Yugoslavia left to Israel. And in the same time, this was the year when Jewish community organized uh, the opening of five monuments built to the victims of the Holocaust on Yugoslav territory in the cities of Belgrade, uh, Novi Sad, Zagreb, Sarajevo, and Jakovo. This uh, whole event lasted from uh, the end of August to the beginning of September of 1952, uh, with the organization of the exhibition in the Jewish community, which was uh, <coughs> later became the Museum of the Jewish uh, History, Historical, Jewish Historical Museum here in Belgrade. And uh, also, mm, this was the moment uh, which clearly present the Jewish community, which we can mark as, Jim Winter marked as a kind of agent of memory. Those who um, save the memory on their uh, members who were killed during the Second World War. Um, the delegation of Israel, State of Israel, was invited. Uh, then Moshe Piyad, as the vice president of the assembly, was presented there, although the official invitation was sent to Yosef Rostito. Uh, but he was not there present. And um, uh, the whole idea was uh, to present the new reality in which Jewish community was commemorating their victims, but in the same time expecting uh, their uh, active participation in the organization of the socialist Yugoslavia of that period. So I think it is very important to stress that uh, uh, although uh, the places of uh, concentration camps, with the exclusion of Yasenovac, were never officially uh, presented as the most important uh, uh, 
spaces of memory or places of memory in socialist Yugoslavia. Uh, in those official representation, the tragedy and uh, it is not the proper word tragedy, but the specific of the Jewish annihilation during the Second World War was presented. Of course, when there was the time when in the whole Europe after 1985 and that uh, incident in Bit at Bitburg's uh, cemetery, the whole uh, quarrel in the public of Germany started. In the same time, in Yugoslav uh, public space, the quarrel between different nations started. And the main topic dealing with the Holocaust, the topic of the collective responsibility, was completely marginalized at the beginning and then during 90s completely lost from the public space. So I think this uh, commission was one something that was officially done after many, many years and we can say decades. And it will stay as a document which I cannot say right now in this moment. Will it be uh, realized in a way uh, the members of the commun commission wanted to be realized because we think, I think, <laughs> I think that it is very important to stress the importance of that place for the Holocaust in Serbia, but in the same time to understand that this place is very important to be memorized by this community because as uh, on one space, uh, Eric Hobsbawm, he wrote, history which is written only for Jews, Afro-Americans, Greeks, women, proletarians, homosexuals, and so on, cannot be good history, although it can give comfort to those who are writing that history. So we need a space, a memorial center, which will reflect the Serbian public and their relationship toward the Holocaust. Although we know that it is very important to allow this space and uh, to really mark why this is mostly important for the representation and memorialization of the Holocaust in Serbia. So, Thank you very much. Again. Uh, excellent food for thought and discussion. Um, I'm not really going to tell you anything that you don't already know, uh, but I think it's necessary to give some context to where we're coming from in, uh, with this project and what we're trying to achieve, I suppose. Um, so as the project has already been outlined by Vera, its title is Portraits and Memories of the Jewish Community in Serbia Before the Holocaust. Um, that really says what it is. Um, the purpose, as the title suggests, is to preserve memory of the Jewish community that existed here prior to the Holocaust. Um, and to describe it in its simplest terms, um, we're trying to create an archive of pre-Holocaust photographs depicting members of the Jewish communities um, and of significant places and events in their lifetimes, uh, and recording testimonies by survivors about the lives of people depicted in those photographs, um, so as to give them meaning. So we're looking at where and when the person, each person was born, depicted in those photographs, their education, their careers, their loves, and uh, where and how those who died in the Holocaust were kidnapped from society and killed. Um, <coughs> the project itself is, uh, is held by the Federation of Jewish Communities and its museum, uh, which is the Jewish Historical Museum in Serbia, here in Belgrade. Um, the Federation was set up just after, uh, just after the Second World War um, to coordinate the Jewish communities in Serbia and the museum was set up in 1948. And they've both got a long history of collecting this kind of material um, and they've cooperated with a large number of institutions and organizations in that time. And that's brought us to today, which we're doing this question. Um, I think that it might be useful to give some kind of indication uh, of the context that we designed the project in. So I'll start with that and then I'll go on to give you some presentation of the database that we referred to, um, which we're using to process the material uh, that uh, the presentation described. Um, so, uh, 
Firstly, due to the almost complete destruction of the Jewish population and their possessions during the Holocaust, and the following post-war policies of managed law and remembrance in Sophia, the photographic record of the, of the priest Holocaust community that's held in public hands for posterity is very small. Um, the majority of the photographs still in existence are scattered among the private family collections, mostly within the Jewish community itself. Um, correspondingly, public memory of the existence of the community has been reiterated time again, it's very weak. Um, and believing that the Holocaust, um, or rather believing that the pre-Holocaust existence of the Jewish community must be remembered and recognizing the visual record of the actual people the Holocaust sought to destroy is a very powerful tool for remembrance and reflecting on tolerance and cultural diversity today, it is important to consolidate this material. Let's gather it together and uh, archive it um, to show what is still in existence and to keep it that way in existence. Um, I think there's a, a reference there to the discussions yesterday that are here. Um, so secondly, the uh, living witnesses of, of the Holocaust, the survivors and other witnesses, non, let's say non-Jewish, uh, members of the non-Jewish non -Jewish members, non -mem non members that aren't the Jewish community, um, uh, who, who were alive prior to the Holocaust and had some intimate knowledge of the community that existed, um, are extremely old, and they are very few in number. Um, there are, to our knowledge, about 350 survivors in the country. Um, and in terms of gathering, sorry, in terms of their memory, a large number of those were born between, say, 1935 and 1942. So what they can provide you in terms of information about the past is, of course, extremely slight. And the vast majority of survivors can mostly tell you only about their childhood. Um, and I think there are questions there that we may address later in terms of how the view of the past through the eyes of a child, remember today, influences this uh, very, let's say, um, dynamic mix between the Holocaust experience and the pre-Holocaust memories and the post-Holocaust memories. Um, so we have two sort of general outcomes and one very specific outcome we're trying to achieve through this project, um, in addition to creating this archive. Um, we're working towards uh, creating an exhibition next year which will tour Serbia. It will use the material um, to uh, facilitate some kind of, we hope, personal engagement with people from the past. Um, photographs and personal testimonies, as we discussed yesterday, have a particular power as seen as having uh, relevance and they are seen to be real evidence of something having existed. And we seek to use that in a way uh, to engage particularly young people. Um, in a more personal engagement with the past. Um, the exhibition will include an education program, workshops at the exhibition, uh, which aim to not only allow reflection on the fundamental, or let's say, um, profound nature of the Holocaust itself, but to reach beyond the Holocaust to reflect on contemporary human rights issues and the importance of tolerance uh, and cultural diversity in any society, and particularly this one. Um, in the future for the purposes of, of non-repetition. Um, secondly, we're hoping to make all the material that we gather um, available to you, to use. Um, it's not simply intended to, to sit in a, in a computer disk somewhere, but that it can be uh, reused in different ways. Now, I'll move over to the database and um, show you a little bit through how, how it works um, and how we intend to both produce our intended outcome, which is this very personalized, say, exhibition or presentation of personal memory, and how we hope that you will be able to use it as a, as a community of researchers and academics, or as filmmakers, as, as uh, writers. Um, so we, uh, we've conducted interviews uh, it's going to take a so, so far we've, uh, we've contacted all the survivors in Serbia that are known, um, and that actually is not quite an exact science as you might imagine. There are some people who are uh, not maintained on any registry within the Federation or other lists. Some, in the cases, 
in, in very vivid cases because they believe that the, they were identified during the Holocaust because their name was on the list and they literally refused to be listed today. Um, that is uh, uh, that is what it is, and, and we simply work around that. So this, this is why I refer to the known survivors. It's not um, not trying to be ambiguous. Um, we've inquired if they possess photographs, and about uh, 200 survivors have reported that they do possess photographs and they're willing to participate in interviews. The vast majority of those are in Belgrade, and that's about 175, and there is uh, small groups of survivors throughout the rest of the country. I'm sure you're familiar with, with some of this yourselves. Um, about 45 interviews have been conducted so far, and about 350 photographs collected. Um, I'll just make a point right there. That's far beyond my expectation when we started. Uh, in some cases, people have dozens of photographs that are very well preserved. They remember a lot of, of information. In other cases, they have one or two, and that's the nature of, 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 of I guess, the, the, the legacy of the destruction of this memory of its physical. Um, anyone who wants to donate photographs to the uh, Jewish Historical Museum can do so the physical photograph, uh, but none have elected to do so so far. And everything is purely digital for the obvious reason that um, survivors are not willing to give up their remaining physical traces of, of their family, their visual memory. Um, I think also it's just to uh, give reference to the urgency I uh, described before. Four or five, I think, now of the survivors who we initially planted to have died, died this year. So the group of people, uh, this, is, this is some indication of how old they are, and a lot of them in very infirm health. Um, great. So I'm going to just go through a little bit uh, some, some say, examples of how we function. We we're trying to record as much information as possible. It will allow you uh, to unpick what we're trying to do. So we will produce, uh, we, we, we've made a process, a tool in effect, uh, this is the content management system, that allows us to, first of all, upload audio files, and video files. Okay. Uh, if it was audio, you could now be listening to the um, to, the, to, the, uh, to the audio files. This allows all the material to be online, everybody to be looking at the same time. I think the point to make there immediately is we have researchers in Subutitz and Navisad, in Belgrade, in Niche, um, and although they're working with a small group of people, um, of course, most of the, 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 uh, the, the survivors, they're, they're often very, um, they come from, they, it's often, in reality, quite small family groups, so you get multiple people referencing the same parts, even if they're in different places. So we tried to create some kind of tool that would allow you to gather information in Subatitsa and gather information in Belgrade and not repeat. I mean, I can't imagine anything worse than producing an exhibition about Holocaust victims and having two photographs of the same people and not, not being able to recognize that we, in fact, have duplicated that. That's incredibly insensitive. So we tried to get around that by, uh, we have a reference to Facebook earlier, I think a lot of this can take uh, inspiration from Facebook, so I'll probably let you do or don't approve of, the, of, of that medium. It has developed types of technology and made them aware to people like us that we can use for other purposes. And so in this case, each photograph is tagged, and the person in the photograph is, is simply named. So if I was, for instance, to, to hopefully this will work. So then I, I simply input who that person is. If, uh, if I start to write a name in here, of, uh, of a person, uh, sorry, Branca. I get all the Brankas who have been in, in use, and that should give us some opportunity to try and make sure we don't uh, duplicate information. Um, if I follow the uh, Branca's um, profile through, I come to her own life story. What we've tried to do is give this as much structure as possible to avoid this, this mixing of memories. Uh, it's basically possible, but to give it some structure. So we first ask the um, survivors to talk about their own lives, and then about each of the, uh, the lives of the people depicted in each of the photographs. So it's very much kind of like a ladder, right, that, that. Um, And we then process the information that they've provided us. So all the information that they give us about uh, Branka, uh, Branka has given us about her own life, is taken from the recording. Uh, so I'm, I will give some kind of 
fictitious example here. Uh, we can tag a moment in the recording where she describes something in her own life or somebody else's. We can open a life event. We then um, select the person that it's about, which in this case is Frank Kovacic. Um, we record the date of the event, and if it's a, a longer term event, between which point those uh, events happen, it might be school, being in school, and it might describe what uh, several years of experience in, in one very short sentence. Um, and so we can select the exact dates. If we don't have exact dates, then we have a method to, to indicate that we have no idea what day one day was, but just in general, which year. We record some kind of digest of that life event, so they're describing their own experience in school or their family member's experience at the synagogue or in life or playing for a football team, you name it. We're really trying to give some human context to that person's life. Uh, that's difficult both to do in, in, say, short sentences that can be reproduced in exhibitions or online. Uh, but that's why we, as we've tagged it in the, in the, um, in the original source, when I, um, I will just ABC, we can uh, ref we, we, we tag locations of events, so something happened in Belgrade, we give it uh, uh, categories. Um, this refers to the period of their life. You might be interested as a researcher in the early life of uh, members of the Jewish community between 1930 and 1940. Well, obviously, their early life slightly overlaps at slightly at different times. So instead of saying, I just want to know everything that happened in 1940, you can inquire um, what were their early experiences between that entire period and get all of the people who were young at some point in that period. Um, and then various other categories that try and make some sense of, of, a, of a biography, um, basically chronologically with this, okay, with this addition of, uh, let's say, kind of personal interests, hobbies, this kind of thing, to give some clarification. Um, and if I scroll down, uh, you see here marked in blue, uh, it's a, a reference point. That allows you, as a, as a researcher, we hope, once we've packaged all this information up into these short statements about the lives and posted them online next to photographs, here's a photograph of Franco Kovacic, here's in extremely brief terms her life story, and you're interested in a particular part of that, rather than taking our, say, uh, interpretation or description, you can go and see the original description yourself of her, or in another case, of her talking about somebody else, um, and review it as you choose. So maybe you can overcome this issue that the uh, other wife was talking about yesterday, uh, of a lack of, of, of clarity about where this comes from. There is very clear problems with the um, I don't know, veracity of the memory. It's mixed up. I don't think there's any intention to mislead at any point. Uh, and I would argue that I think these people are extremely committed to trying to remember something in form that resembles what happened. They're just not always able to express that. Um, so you can go and then see that for yourself. You can listen to the audio, some of the cases with the videos. Um, there are references to transcripts so you can see which part of it is. And instead of watching three hours of video to see what you're looking for, you can jump from specific uh, descriptions of life events and photographs and, and times of, 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 of aspects of that community, whatever the outcome is, back to the original source. And the point is that there might be several original sources. There might be five interviews that reference, uh, let's say, um, the, the Federation, uh, or the Muslim Federation, so let's say Belgrade, uh, um, and you want to see how each person described that. Well, you can link back through from that final discussion, the final uh, description, back through to those original sources. So it's kind of this retro retroactive working. Um, so I won't say that because it will mess up the big bit. Um, the, as I've shown with, with Branka's uh, profile, uh, we're recording family relationships as we go along. So each time you input somebody uh, into the database, when you tag them, it automatically creates what we call a historical person profile. We've had to divide up between, although survivors are obviously historically of the period that we're interested in, as sources of information, uh, they will provide usually one interview, one set of information, and move on. In the future, it's our anticipation that the vast majority of any future information that might go in here will be from archives and other resources and successor generations. And I think we needed to find a way to divide up between this original kind of source and, and, and the people that they, they are talking about, even if it's themselves. Um, so here you can see uh, her mother, and we can jump straight into her profile and see her life story. Um, 
we have a short description of Franca's um, uh, uh, life story or life events here. I mean, we're not trying to be too bold in claiming we're writing whole biographies here. We're just trying to create some organized uh, description of the fractions of memories that were given when talking about these photographs, to give those photographs some meaning. Um, and in that, one of our kind of driving motivations is, even if all these photographs, they continue to be held in private hands, they can continue to be used um, for research or, or memory purposes or education purposes in the future, but at a certain point, nobody will be able to identify who those people are. It's already a problem. It's already a problem for survivors to recognize who people are in photographs, who they knew as children. So by, 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 by tagging everything, by recording these uh, bytes of information, you can always go back to the original source. You can always go, if, if, if for instance, you wanted to produce an exhibition like ours uh, on a different subject, you could use this tool to uh, gain specific access. Uh, so, so, I mean, this is a, this is a tool rather than the final database that you, you would be able to access. But for example, search for uh, Subotitsa at a certain time, a certain subject, and suck out all the information, all the photographs, the interview uh, segments that reference that, and uh, the descriptions of those photographs, and the lives of the people presented in those photographs, um, you can reuse that um, how, how you choose. The quality of the photographs that we're documenting, we're scanning as much as possible. In some cases, survivors won't let us take away a box of the photographs. Uh, so we use digital cameras in the field. Uh, they have very high resolution, but still, it's not great. It's good, it's not great. If you wanted to produce large, serious, uh, let's say, memorial material and presentation to people, you'd have to go back into the field. But you would be able to identify those people. You know where the photographs are, you know how to act, how to contact them, and who the people in the photographs are, the places, even if in the future the survivors aren't there to describe it to, to you. So it's, it's both creating a tool for us to get from this initial point of all this raw material, to process it, to bring it together, to create individual uh, life stories, uh, which is shown here, of people in uh, photographs. And then we have what we call some kind of uh, so digest of uh, these biographical material. They might come from different stories, sources. So the Dragon receives information from one person that describes somebody from the past, uh, a member of the Jewish community. Vera also gets information about that person. It's brought together here on their profile. But some of that information might repeat, it might uh, contradict, um, and you, you, all of that is happening. So then we have the opportunity for that to be um, transcribed and digested down into something that we can essentially just print and give to a designer and go into the exhibition. It's, we don't, I, don't, I don't anticipate having the time to go through hundreds of photographs. I think we're probably going to get between 500 and 1,000 in the end. And all of the, the descriptions, and all of the descriptions of the people in them. While we're doing the design work, that's a huge amount of reprocessing that we're trying to avoid, so that essentially that happens at this stage of the processing. Um, it's, it's done here. This is just a, this is just a description. It's just a book. Um, but it's bringing together various statements. Um, if we want to, how, how, how that works is that this, this is the statement that you might see online describing that person's life. It might be incredible. You know, memories. There is even cases where somebody who could, can't remember the <coughs> family name of some a member of their family. They, they don't remember their original and just, just their married name. So, for example, here, if we want to. Uh, okay. Um, so, they, they, the, the son was born and. You, we want to transfer this over into the giant digest that will be publicly accessible, by what you guys would see on a web portal or a database, and um, all the public. We just click here, it, 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 click here. That information is also going to be transferred over. Then we can then revise the, trend, the description. We might decide that we want to. Um, I mean, I would have to take just a random example here, but there are two sources that we want to uh, uh, combine in this kind of final uh, description. That means that both of these points are now tagged to this final description. If you were to look at, so it says here only the, the, the date of birth of the child, but if there was some other information you wanted to describe about that child's early life, you might add that here rather than having multiple broken up parts of that biography. And it all goes in there, the dates would be amended, um, you might add some kind of other, other tags here. And once that's online in some kind of 
say, your final web presentation, you can then jump from this, I'll save this so you'll see it come out. Um, yeah, and then press F5, and then, sorry, so we have some things. So, so you can see here, this is now over here. What this means is that we, when we want to uh, produce all of this, we want to print it, we just click export, and then all of this hopefully would be done here. And there is this, okay, I'm not going to bother going through that, but it just comes out in an Excel table. It shows all of the facts about this person's life, their date of birth, their date of death, the known place of death, the known place of birth, known family relations, and then this very short digest of their biography. And the idea is that this is a biography that we can print and put in the exhibition or can go online, and it's fairly clear that that's accurate. And what I mean by that is that we're getting lots of information that we can't cross-reference. We're relying purely on their, on their memory. And there isn't another source in lots of cases to cross-reference that. Um, some of it, some things that are said are clearly not accurate. Dates when laws were brought in and it affected their lives. We, we know when those laws were brought in. That can be cross-reference. But beyond that, it's very ephemeral. Um, so what we then will end up with uh, in, a, in a, some kind of uh, publicized database is all of this material, um, these final, um, these photographs which can be accessed however you choose according to various criteria, descriptions of those photographs, if there's some duplication it's used, you can see here, um, the descriptions of the lives of people in those photographs, it'll work a little bit, um, I have got something here, yeah. here, a little bit like this, so um, this was one of the interviewees, uh, and do it yet. Just pull out all the photographs that have been collected so far about that person from various different sources and the descriptions of the photographs. And then if you want to come in, just do it. Okay. Yeah. So we can now see some more detail about those photographs and then so on and so forth. That hasn't been designed yet, but that's our overall intention. Um, I'm not sure if there is anything else to describe.
once we've worked out how to structure it, we've worked out how to, we've asked the survivors that we can use the material for the exhibition we're designing for future research purposes, more or less with the proviso if they don't like it when they see it, then we'll kind of take it offline, we'll ask you as a user to, and you to, to take it down from whatever you're using it. We're really anticipating this for a lot of online users because, as Vera mentioned, that it's not even so much that the future will be dominated by online presentation and pop -ups. It's more that I think in five years they'll look back at this kind of research project and they'll be appalled that we haven't tried to do this um, to make this kind of availability and trackability of the data. Um, and I think that's it. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. Thank you, James. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, yes, uh, as uh, Mira has announced, I'm uh, doing my PhD research in uh, Berkeley University. Uh, my research actually uh, deals uh, with the history of use of documentary and uh, short film festival. Uh, but uh, for this occasion, I will um, analyze uh, um, the films on the topic uh, of the Holocaust that were screened uh, during the history of this festival, or the representations uh, of the Holocaust uh, in the films that were selected uh, for the festival in uh, two periods of its history. Uh, the first one being the socialist one, uh, since the festival's creation in 1954. Uh, until the late 80s, early 90s, and the second one, uh, the post-socialist one uh, from the 1990s until today with a focus um, on the period uh, of war. The paper explores why uh, during the wars in ex Yugoslavia, when the festival actually abandoned its um, old, uh, very strong Yugoslav profile and turned instead um, to uh, themes belonging to the Serbian nationalist discourse, why the Holocaust was the only theme uh, related to the memory of uh, World War II that still remained uh, in the festival's uh, programs. Analyzing the change uh, in the festival's programming policies at the times of the country's political and ideological transition, the paper illustrates how political conditions influence creative processes and exhibition patterns in the field of documentary film. The research is based on an uh, investigation of the festival's documentation, including catalogs, print materials, and press clippings. And I will start uh, with a brief um, presentation of the festival's uh, beginnings, uh, explaining its, uh, the aim of its uh, uh, creation and its uh, organizational structure. I will then provide an overview of the festival's profile in the two periods and compare the data uh, related to the uh, Holocaust films. I will end uh, with a textual analysis of two films. Lorenz of Anu's film, um, the, uh, Yasinovac, The Cruelest Death Camp of All Times, that uh, won the Grand Prix at a festival in 1984. And uh, the second one is called um, Yama, or The Pit Grote Morta, by uh, Milord Bajic, um, a documentarist uh, who spent most of uh, his uh, working time uh, working on this topic. And this was actually uh, the first film uh, from this, uh, we can now say even a series, uh, that was screened at the festival at the beginning um, of the 90s, so it was that opened that series. So just uh, in order to be clear um, about which festival we're talking uh, about, uh, the festival was created in 1954 as a youth film festival with the aim of being a mirror of the national annual film production in all the genres. In 1959 it was divided into two and fiction uh, films stayed in Pula and that is the festival that is still held in Pula and the uh, Yugoslav Documentary and Short Film Festival took place uh, for the first time in Belgrade in 1960. The event has been organized by public institutions ever since uh, its um, creation. That means that it has been on the state budget ever since it was founded. And uh, all the constitutive parts of Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia were equally represented in all of its bodies. That means that uh, all the selection committees, jury members, etc. were coming from all the uh, six republics and the films were also coming uh, from production houses from all the parts uh, um, of Yugoslavia. Basically, the festival carefully cherished uh, the ideas of Yugoslav socialism, both in terms of its organizational structure and uh, in terms of its uh, programming policy. The cult of uh, Yugoslavia being largely built on the uh, imaginary of World War II, the memory of war was also one of the recurring topics uh, in Yugoslav cinema. The festival repeatedly praised the Yugoslav revolutionary heritage and anti-fascist struggle, and World War II uh, was the far most dominant theme uh, in its programs until the late 80s, early 90s, in line with the key political events in the country. The national liberation uh, struggle played such an important um, uh, role in the festival's history that until 1967 uh, it even had its own unit uh, 
if you can see on the, the right side actually, in the festival catalogs. However, the Holocaust uh, as a part of World War II uh, history was not at all a recurrent topic in this period. On the contrary, uh, in these uh, 36 uh, editions of the festival, there were only six films on the Holocaust um, that were screened um, in the period. The films that spoke of uh, World War II dealt instead um, with themes such as the achievements of Yugoslav partisans in general, celebration of important dates from the socialist calendar, and so on. The films that touched the Holocaust issue were not even all of them always directly linked to the topic. Uh, when they were, they mostly depicted the sufferings in the concentration camps in the fascist independent state of Croatia. Uh, there were uh, two films on um, uh, Yasinovac, that we can see on the slide. There was one film on the trial about the trials to uh, the members of Chetnik and Ustasha uh, movements. Then uh, one film on Vanitsa, and uh, a film about an event uh, in a prison in Hungary in 1944. Uh, and then as well I included here a, a film uh, by Nick Shadyovic, which now to be repeated, where he filmed the Montenegro painter who actually spoke more in general against uh, fascism. In line with the concepts of uh, socialist Yugoslavia, these films uh, strongly insisted on the fascist aspect of the depicted crimes, uh, that the ones who committed them were supporters of an ideology that was in its core opposite um, uh, to the socialist one, and that uh, the victims uh, were coming from all the parts, all parts of Yugoslavia, as exemplified from synopsis of these films. As we can see here, for example, over 80,000 prisoners of war from all the parts of the country passed through the camp at Vanitsa. The witnesses speak about suffering oppression in these people. Or, documentary quite a testimony about the concentration camp Yasinovac, where Pavlic Ustasha killed uh, several hundred thousand men, women, and children from all parts of Yugoslavia. In the 90s, uh, with the beginning of the disintegration of the Federation, the festival structure changed. Uh, other republics were one by one dropping off uh, uh, from the festival. And since 1991, uh, actually all the films, as well as the entire management, were only from uh, Serbia. Sometimes, uh, in a smaller extent, also from Montenegro. And interestingly, uh, occasionally, even from uh, the Republic of Srpska, even if the festival was not an international festival. And then again, when the, once the festival became an international festival, it happened occasionally that films from the Republic of Srpska were competing in national competition, whereas films from Slovenia or Croatia, for example, competed in international competition. <coughs> but basically, once the Yugoslav festival became a local Serbian event. And with these changes, the central themes uh, in the film screen the, that were screened at the festival changed as well. The focus was now on the topics which mark the distance from the period of Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and put an emphasis on the Serbian national history, such as Orthodox Church, Serbian medieval culture and heritage, negative image of Tito's personality and flaws of Tito's Yugoslavia, Serbian victims in the ongoing wars in the 90s and throughout history. More and more selected films show disapproval of Yugoslav concepts and put blame on other constituted peoples of the former country for different injustices throughout history. That said, World War II practically disappeared from the festival screens. However, the Holocaust remained, but in an altered way uh, than compared to what was in the socialist period, as I will show now. Basically, whereas in the entire period from the festival's creation in 1954 until the beginning of the 90s, we had only six uh, films um, on the topic of the Holocaust screened, uh, in the second period from 1990, uh, 1990 until today, in 25 uh, festival editions, there were 15 films that touched uh, this uh, topic. Uh, from these 15 films, uh, eight of them were screened uh, between 1991 uh, and 1995, so in five festival editions, during or right uh, before anticipating uh, the war in Croatia, we had eight films as compared to six films uh, in uh, 36 uh, uh, festival editions. Among them, uh, the ones that were screened in the 90s, uh, there was only one uh, which was screened out of competition, which was a story uh, of a, a Jewish uh, girl, Hilda Deitch, uh, who died uh, in uh, the Saimishta concentration uh, camp. 
The, most of the films, the majority of them, spoke of the crimes committed by the Croatian troops, especially in the concentration camps and in the pits in the independent state of Croatia, with the focus on Serbian victims. Then there was uh, some kind of a pause of 10 years, and uh, in the last period I have identified seven more films on this topic that were screened since 2005 until today, and those ones included more of testimonies of actual uh, Jewish survivors. This is an interesting uh, synopsis of the film screen uh, during the war uh, in this Yugoslavia. So basically what was in socialist times uh, presented as a crime against uh, anti-fascists from all the parts of our country was now changed into crimes against Serbs, Jews and Roma. The film that opened uh, the series was, as I mentioned, the documentary Grotte Morta, The Pit, by Milorad Bajic in 1991, which addressed the crimes that had been committed by Croatian Ustasha in the pits of the Velvet Mountain area. In 1992, the, uh, the festival program, Madonna Queen of Crows, by uh, the veteran Krzysztof Kanata, about Ustasha mass execution of children, and artists about genocide, Milic of Matra, presenting the motive of genocide against Serbs in the work of painter Milic of Matra, very well known in uh, the Serbian uh, media for his nationalist political orientation. And then the other films followed. Basically, uh, from uh, something that we could call fascist, fascist versus anti-fascist plan, the discourse on these events was now moved to a Serbian versus anti-Serbian plan. The issue of nation came into focus. I will now illustrate that uh, with a comparative analysis of a lot of the film, uh, on, yeah, documentary on Yasinovac and Milorad Bajic, uh, the bit about the Morta, starting with their synopsis. And here we uh, have the synopsis of uh, the family's film that uh, says, uh, towards the end, in the second part, here on these meadows and in this Sava river lie ashes and blood of Serbs, Croats, Slovenians, Jews, Roms, and others who bore the burnt of the eggers and mallets of the Quislings. On the other hand, we have uh, uh, the film uh, The Pit from 1991 uh, that not only puts an emphasis on the Serbian victims and uh, on the uh, Croats as the exact executors, but also in a, an elegant way even puts the Jewish ones, I would say, in the back plan, saying, this documentary film is about monstrous crimes of the Croatian hostages committed against the Serbs and the Jews during the existence of fascist independent Croatian state. This uh, mistake in the translation is, I believe, by the um, uh, festival management. In the Serbian original, it is correct. Um, and then says, uh, these war crimes differ from the ones uh, that uh, the Jews were exposed to in Germany and other European countries because there they were killed in gas chambers and crematoriums, the factories of that, coldly and methodically. The genocide on the Serbs uh, in Croatia was carried out with unrivaled cruelty and sadism, with ritual murders, bestial tortures, with, which surpasses the powers of human imagination. This 50 minute film mentions, mentions Jewish victims exactly two times. First time on the 17th minute, with this, this is actually a quote uh, from that part of the film, and then once again on the 29th minute. The film starts with an explanation of the context in which these crimes happened explaining the beginning of World War II by saying this is the very first sentence in the film. The unannounced war that Hitler started on the 6th of April 1941 against the Kingdom of Yugoslavia was foremost a war against Serbia and Serbian people. On the other hand, the Planowitz film starts with voiceover saying, Yasinovac is a small village by the river. You will not find this name anywhere on the map. But yes, I know it's a huge ocean of pain that appears on every map of crimes committed by fascists in World War II. The narrator in the family's film further speaks of a, quote, furious campaign against the Jews and the communists. The anti-communist spirit is the important element of the political character of fascism, even in its creation of social version. Croatian patriots, Serbs, Jews, gypsies, became the victims of notorious Pavlic's decree on sending disobedient and perilous persons to labor camps and concentration camps. While well, the film includes testimonies given in different dialects of serb croatian languages, as well as in Slovenian, for example, peoples whose names suggest that they were indeed coming from different parts of our country, also testimony by a Roma survivor, Bajic's film uh, includes testimonies only from Serbian victims, four of them female, 
one, uh, a male one, uh, who confessed how after he uh, managed to escape from the pit, he joined the Chetnik movements and fought against Ustasha's and partisans. The film features a series of disturbing authentic testimonies of the survivors, but this material is glued, uh, is glued together with a one-sided voice over abundant criticism of the, quote, the new communist regime. To end, uh, I will uh, compare the way the two films end. The final one uh, kind of looking into the future, while the other one is maybe looking a bit more into the past. The Frankish uses uh, uh, a speech that uh, Tito gave in Glina in 1952 as a, uh, a voice from the off that quotes, among others, it was a place where certain creations were dying side by side. It was not only about extermination of ethnicities, it was about the extermination of progressive people as well as. Uh, communist progressive people who wanted things to be better than before. The entire nations are not to be blamed for a small number of traitors. Try to find the guilty, the ruling clique. That is to be blamed, not the entire nation they belong to. And Tito then continues, there is no more inter-ethnic hatred and there must not be any. And finally, uh, uh, the documentary The Fit uh, from 1991 uh, ends uh, revealing a rather shocking uh, material of the film crew that uh, goes actually down in one of the pits and uh, digs through the skulls and uh, the bones. Uh, this, uh, these images are cut uh, uh, when he goes back to the testimony of uh, one of the victims who says only I, Jovan Karadoja from the pit, I'm sending this message to everybody, to the Serbs. With Croats, you can eat and drink, but never trust them. Never trust them. And then uh, the camera goes back in the pit, where the filmmaker is actually hugging the, the bones. I don't know if you can see. Here. And uh, says that he wanted to take these skulls of, uh, quote, his brothers, the Orthodox Serbs, and to send a message to the Pope. To conclude, while the messages sent through the films of the Holocaust and the socialist period had as a goal a political reconciliation, where one is, was not insisting on the nationality of the victims, but rather on the relation between fascism and anti-fascism, in the post-socialist period, these films had a dual role. They helped the Serbian victimization narrative and contributed to the creation of the myth of ancestral hatred, hatred which allegedly united Croatian people against the Serbs. Basically, images of the enemy of the, in the ongoing war uh, were used uh, to uh, discredit the enemy. This is especially important knowing the wider context in which these films were screened. According to Mark Thompson's study, Forging War, the Media in Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, and Herzegovina during the 1990s, the word Ustasha was repeatedly used in Serbian media controlled uh, by the government as a synonym for Croatian people, purposely creating confusion and spreading hatred. Furthermore, according to Thompson, TV programs about Ustasha crimes and their uh, Ust Croatian Ustashas and their crimes from World War II became a trend in the 90s because of the author insisting on crimes against Serbian people served the regime's goal to point the attention in a different direction, far away, away from the crimes committed by Serbian armies. The shifting nature of historical representations of uh, this historical event exemplifies the transition from a pro-socialist festival to a pro-Serbian nationalist one. I argue that the Holocaust remained in the programs uh, of the festival in the 1990s and later on as the only theme related to the memory of World War II as a part of the larger trend of instrumentalization of history and political purposes. The memory of the Holocaust, therefore, leaves its victims behind, their testimonies in several cases being misused for political and ideological purposes. Thank you. When I was invited uh, by Professor Dakovic and uh, the organizers, uh, I was thinking it's maybe a not a good platform for me uh, to participate in this um, conference because I used to work at the university for 10 years, but I'm out of academia for the last five years. And, uh, but then I was thinking it's maybe also interesting to share with you uh, the new trends in education and teaching about Holocaust that I do last uh, four and a half years with Anne Frank uh, House Amsterdam. Uh, the 
I'll start first with because I'm uh, traveling a lot and uh, participating in different seminars and teaching methods and uh, sharing experiences. I would like to tell you a few of the trends uh, at the moment. One is this uh, not shocking uh, view anymore, but that's for last decade. We don't show uh, shocking uh, pictures. We don't show them. We don't show, uh, show them horrible movies horrible dramas, even it's not like a shocking, but it's more like uh, manipulating the audience if you put uh, sad uh, music and some sad uh, uh, footage, it could be manipulating and uh, we decided not to do that. And uh, it's more like uh, to create debate and to give the youth a uh, chance to think and to find their own conclusions, what they think, what happened. And, uh, but also, so, but uh, it uh, seems to work, and Anne Frank House is doing that for the last 10 years. That's that uh, peer guiding. When we work with the smaller groups of youth, uh, I'm working with students and high students, like uh, 16 to 20, 25. And uh, when we uh, work with them, then we use them or we give them opportunity to teach their peers in their schools or. Uh, youth organizations, and that's the methodology we are doing. And then it's also like a no manipulation, no uh, shocking effects. It's also a new uh, trend is to uh, uh, think about, uh, yeah, I wanted to say something more about youth yeah, peer guiding and um, their own decision, and uh, I will come uh, later. And uh, second, uh, uh, Thing is in the educational uh, trends and so is how we are going to teach about Holocaust in very uh, near future when all of the survivors uh, disappeared and uh, we wouldn't be able to invite uh, guest speakers uh, to share with us their testimonials. There, there are some uh, uh, ideas maybe to use holograms with uh, testimonials. That's that uh, Shaw Foundation in California that they are uh, collecting uh, live testimonials, like a uh, beginning. Uh, there are so many different uh, things to think about uh, how we are going to teach later. But then uh, I was thinking uh, uh, for this uh, Anne Frank uh, uh, methodology, it's most important to uh, show uh, uh, show uh, youth uh, different uh, perspectives. And that is what we are doing with uh, roles, role models like uh, perpetuators, bystanders, helpers, and victims. And to give them the chance to see that all of these roles are uh, fluctuating, that they are possible to be changed, that no one is born to get into one role and to stay into that role. We don't want to teach, uh, because that was the trend in Holland for many years, to uh, teach the Holocaust from the perspective of a uh, victim. And that's also like not only a uh, 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 perspective that we think that's really important. In Germany, they were more using perspective, perspective of perpetrators, which is also good. That is what we are doing nowadays more and more in Holland. With Anne Frank House, we, uh, we have that uh, uh, beautiful occasion that we, had, uh, that we have helpers, people who help uh, uh, hiding uh, of uh, Frank family and others. And then we have that idea of uh, rages among the nation and helpers. And of course, the bystanders, like the whole uh, society. And uh, that is the methodology that we try to do and to teach them that all the roles are changeable and all the roles are uh, important. And we even have uh, workshops that you uh, mark uh, different uh, roles, a different uh, group of, uh, uh, how do you say that, uh, <laughs> participants. participants. And then you even uh, give, uh, uh, that's for high schools, uh, even give the chance to uh, graduate their uh, uh, participation in this uh, one in, in certain event from one till five, and then they can choose who is more perpetrator, who is more victim, who is more bystander, and to uh, give them a chance to uh, think about uh, 
different uh, uh, shades of uh, one. Uh, I'm uh, uh, fully for like uh, there is a black and white, there is no gray area in who was wrong or uh, I'm not in that. But I think it's very uh, good and important that they uh, can discover that it's like a not uh, black and white thing that you can uh, think about it. And then uh, the other thing is that uh, a former colleague of mine, Eric Somers from uh, Dutch Institute for War Documentation, wrote his uh, PhD about how the memorial centra should look like, and that uh, remind me of this Holocaust memorial in uh, Skopje. Uh, in his research, he saw it that is that uh, how we are going to teach after uh, all the witness uh, disappeared, and there is no trend in uh, memorialization. That is that uh, he claims that uh, people are looking for authenticity, for experience. They want to experience what happened. And that's also this tiny line, uh, should we go into that or not? Uh, should we show them how was the uh, earthquake in Kobe and put them in a room to shake there? Or should we bring them to the guest chambers until a certain moment? But OK, that's the new trend. And uh, I wanted also to share with you uh, about it. And to go back uh, with uh, my choice for Alexander Tishma was uh, when I was thinking, uh, OK, I'm coming from another part that's um, education. And so I was thinking which uh, book and what uh, should be which representation of which uh, artistic or uh, media thing in Serbia. I grew up in Vojvodina, and I'm next year half, of year, half of my life in Holland. But I st I'm still Serbian. And, uh, well, then I choose uh, Alexander Tishma, Knigo of Lamo, Book uh, of Lam, because he got uh, all of this uh, very, uh, I think that everyone knows, it goes of uh, Razia in Novi Sad, this uh, three days in January 1942. And I even heard that you read it in French. And uh, uh, I choose this book because uh, it has a few of uh, uh, great moments. That is. Uh, what is really important for the Balkans, and I should say for Serbia that I really uh, follow, it has uh, uh, this uh, problem with uh, multiple uh, uh, roles. We have multiple victims. We have Jews and we have Serbs. In Holland, it's really clear situation. The Jews that are victims and the Dutch is not. And it's, we, here we have Serbs and Jews like uh, equal. And, uh, other thing is also that kind of uh, uh, beautiful thing and important for this uh, uh, region, for Serbia, is that we have also multiple uh, perpetrators. We have uh, Hungarian nationalists who are really killing for their national uh, uh, explosion uh, or revival of their national uh, feeling, but also anti semitists that uh, in Holland is also different. They, were, like, uh, they kill Jews because they are anti semites more than they are uh, romantic nationalists. And that's good to have here. And uh, it is really good. Uh, I was uh, thinking, and um, I didn't make presentation um, that I feel a little bit sorry, but I'm promising all of you that I'll make a kind of workshop based on uh, uh, Book of Land with uh, good uh, passages from book that we can uh, work with you in Serbia uh, to think uh, what kind of pet potatoes we have here, who was uh, just drafted uh, because he was drafted, who was a uh, nationalistic uh, Hungarian uh, young uh, who was really anti-Semitic, who was, and we have that really very well uh, described in a book that we can use that, uh, that perspective. And also to choose who was more uh, wrong uh, and who less. We have a good description, the, the description of uh, bystanders, helpers. I found it everything uh, like very well motivated and uh, what is also uh, very good is that uh, this uh, uh, Blan is a person who is uh, just finishing high school. He's 18, 
and that's very well described uh, how a uh, young person uh, just uh, waiting for this life to happen to him is uh, uh, put him in a horrible situation of the war. And uh, he described Tishma very well how was that uh, also motivation for a few of his characters that uh, youth sentiment to become resistant fighters because that was their rebellion against situation around them and they wanted to start their life. How was that uh, uh, reason for uh, other uh, characters not to do anything, just to wait that everything uh, goes, pass over and down to start his life. And that's also very good. I think it's uh, going to work with uh, youth, that kind of recognition uh, of that youth sentiment. What should I do in the situation like that, if I'm just 18 and uh, that's a very good thing, and uh, uh, yeah, what I wanted to say is um, that I forgot, uh, that's maybe interesting for you, uh, the, what I uh, learned in uh, Anne Frank uh, House methodology. With this not black and white, we have that moment that um, the Frank family and other people are uh, in hiding place, they're uh, betrayed in um, of Augustus 1944, they got arrested and uh, only Otto Frank survived of them died uh, in concentration camps. And then, of course, one of the first questions when the uh, kids come to Anne Frank house, they ask us, uh, who betrayed them? Who betrayed them? And that's horrible that we, after 70 years, still don't know who betrayed them. That's uh, research that's still going on that we really don't know. But on the educational uh, point, we have that good uh, moment to say, OK, uh, it's really not necessary to know who betrayed them. But let's think, uh, talk about uh, why it's horrible to betray them, why it's good to help them, how does it feel. And that's that uh, thing that I uh, think we should do it here more. And uh, that's good for uh, And uh, something more. And that uh, with Terazia uh, in uh, Novi Sad and uh, the Book of Ban is also a beautiful thing that we have a uh, Tibor Cherish book uh, called Days from uh, 60s, uh, who is uh, uh, telling the story about Novi Sad Razia from a uh, perpetuator's uh, perspective. The, uh, he's explained, he's uh, describing a group of uh, arrested uh, uh, Hungarian. Uh, fascists who are in jail in uh, uh, Hungary after the war. And that whole book uh, has that horrible, uh, uh, closed, uh, claustrophobic uh, atmosphere that's really uh, scary to read, but that's uh, the intention uh, of the writer. And it's uh, good to compare with this uh, book if you write both of them. Uh, especially opening and closing scene of uh, Book of Blam is uh, that kind of completely open, almost uh, uh, bathing, uh, completely lost feeling of someone who survived. And that's also a good thing to compare uh, how it feels if you su su survive and, uh, and uh, you don't need to be punished and you should be happy and you're not able to be happy. And that's very, very good point. And, uh, uh, that's that, I think, because I really uh, wrote it how you can do it, uh, different roles and so, but I'm promising you that we will have in, uh, with 27th of January, we have a project at Anne Frank, uh, National Library of Serbia, and Terraforming and, and Serbian NGO is doing, and we are making uh, teaching materials around uh, Memorial Days. And our first set will be done for 27th of January. And I'll spread, uh, sp uh, spread uh, uh, with you, as you can see, what I made of Book of Life. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, as, as, as Nadej kindly uh, mentioned, the main focus of my research in recent years has been Holocaust remembrance in Serbia, and in particular, the long-standing and continuing neglect of Sajmishtev. Uh, site in Belgrade. A parallel interest of mine has also been 
the interplay between individual and collective remembering and the role that survivor testimonies have played in the writing of history and importing the public understanding of the Holocaust and other forms of genocidal violence in Yugoslavia during the Second World War. But today I would like to switch to a different medium of representation uh, and consider the role of photography in representing atrocity, specifically atrocities committed at the largest concentration camp in Yugoslavia during the Second World War, namely Yasevans. Uh, there, there are several reasons why critical engagement with visual imagery is important when dealing with representations of Yasevans. First, photographs, and specifically atrocity images, are a central feature of Yasevans' memory, especially in Serbia and in Republika Srpska. Over the years, they featured prominently in memorial exhibitions, in books, documentaries, and media reports on the subject. One can even speak of a distinct aesthetic of Yasevans' memory, captured in a number of iconic images that have helped frame the public understanding of crimes committed at that camp. And although the dissemination of atrocity images reached a peak in the late 1980s and early 1990s, when the reopening of the so-called Yasinovac question transformed the camp's history and memory into an important source of nationalist mobilization, the use of atrocity images has enduring relevance. Ongoing debates about how Yasinovac should be remembered often revolve around the role that atrocity photographs play in the representation of this camp. So in some sense, Yasinovac offers a useful starting point for asking some searching questions about the commemorative and educational value of atrocity photographs, about the precise source of their symbolic and evidentiary power, as well as about the ethics of their continued dissemination and circulation. So as part of this work on atrocity photographs, I'm interested in exploring how images have been used over the years to represent Yasinovitz and unpack the complex nexus of factors, psychological, political, cultural, and religious, that might explain their enduring presence and appeal. In Serbia. And as well as mapping the broader history of the visual representations of atrocities, this research also includes a small number of case studies of specific photographs, looking at the origins, different readings, narrative framings, and interpretations over time. Today, however, because of the limited time available to us, I will seek to extract some general points about the visual representations of Yasinovets. Historically, images of atrocity have featured in representations of Yasinovets ever since the end of the Second World War through the work of the Yugoslav War Crimes Commission. During a number of visits to Yasinovets in May and June 1945, investigators took a large number of photos uh, at the site uh, and gathered photographic evidence, both in terms of forensic images, uh, uh, and uh, sort of they, they took photos of the destroyed uh, buildings and also the human remains exhumed during the investigation. The commission generally placed a strong emphasis on gathering of photographic evidence both forensic images taken by its investigators and wartime snapshots of crimes confiscated from captured soldiers found, found amongst the property or documentation left behind by the retreating armies. These were collected, not just to be presented as, as, as in evidence during war crimes trials, where their role tended to be peripheral, but also because the authorities recognized their propaganda potential. The Commission granted thousands of requests for photographs from the press and organized a series of exhibitions that toured the country, the largest of which included around 1,000 exhibits, most of them photographs. In the Commission's publication, specifically on Yasinovets, the central motif was the brutality of the killers and their sadistic disposition. However, this, at the time, was not in itself unique. For the authorities, all fascists were referred to as, as pathological killers, and some of the Commission's writing Fascism is presented almost as a personality disorder or a cause of a psychosis resulting in frenzied and brutal killing orders. On the other hand, in the overall hierarchy of fascist psychopaths, the Ustasha occupied occasionally a privileged place. As a 1945 propaganda documentary about the camp stated, there are no other examples in history remotely similar to the Ustasha crimes in Yasinovets, emphasizing the horrific and indescribable torture of prisoners and the sadistic and pathological urges of the perpetrators. The War Crimes Commission report on Yasinovets similarly highlighted the cruelty of, and as a specialty of the Ustasha and described the method of killing in detail. All of these were, were also illustrated with photographs. Importantly, at the time, the, uh, the, the tendency was to deflect the ultimate responsibility for the crimes to the Germans and to Nazism, and this is a trend that persisted in subsequent decades. But the key thing was, it was that Yasinovitz was, from the outset, associated with indescribable cruelty, uh, and, and this was made salient through the use of atrocity images. 
as the first public exhibition of such images held in Zagreb in 1945, suggested these images of a permanent documentary proof of the beastly means by which the Ustasha tortured and murdered patrons. But in the decades that followed, the images that were used to illustrate crimes committed at Yasinovitz were largely confined either to the images that were taken by the War Crimes Commission during its investigation, or because of the costs of reproducing images, uh, the writing of Yasinovitz tended to be illustrated with drawings or sketches rather than photographs. But in the, in the decades that followed, the number of images that were used to illustrate Yasinovitz began to grow steadily. This is mainly because crimes committed elsewhere tended to be attributed to Yasinovitz. And Natasha Matausic's book, Yasinovitz Photomographia, published in 2008, analyzes some prominent examples. So, for example, a series of images that was published in 1945 by the War Crimes Commission, showing bodies of mostly Croatian civilians ex executed by Ustasha in Sisak, were later published in numerous exhibitions and books as representing the victims of Yasinovitz. The same has happened to a series of images showing the de decapitation of captured parties and soldiers in Slovenia, which were also reproduced as, as showing Yasinovets. Uh, in the 1993 documentary, Bobby Kravati, uh, uh, a cropped image uh, which, which was collected by the War Crimes Commission showing Chetnik crimes was portrayed as, as a, a crime uh, of the of the Ustashe. And one of the, the sort of more dramatic examples of this misattribution is that even the images that were taken in Dachau uh, are showing the, the, the iconic images of, of piles of skeleton prisoners have featured in various exhibitions and books as having taken place uh, in Yasinovitz. And this kind of misattribution of images is of course not, not unique, both in the Yugoslav context and elsewhere. One frequently finds examples where images from one camp or one atrocity are used to illustrate different locations and events. Um, and in some sense, the main driving force behind this misattribution was the desire to have a visual record of a crime. And because photographs are widely regarded as incontestable evidence and as possessing the kind of immediacy and authority unavailable to other forms of representation. So in this in, with this in mind, it is perhaps unsurprising that some of the earliest misattributions, including the ones brought in Dachau, uh, have featured in memoirs of survivors which was published in the 1960s and 70s. For example, David Berger's 44 months in Yasinovets, or Nikola Nikolic's The Yasinovets Death Camp. Now, I don't know whether survivors themselves selected the images for publication or whether this was done by editors, often members of the veterans organization or fellow survivors, but either way, one can imagine that as there were certain images in various archives and museum collections, they were not necessarily looking for photographs of Yasinovets itself, but for images that captured the essence of what was remembered about the camp. These images feature in the memoirs not so much as representations of historical truth about Yasinovets, but simply as illustrations of the survivor's traumatic memory of the camp experience. However, we have the right to be a bit more critical when it comes to, to the way that the photographs was used by experts, the likes of Vladimir Dedier, Anton Miletic, Milan Gulaic, Drago Lukic, and others, who emerged in the 1980s as the key creators of public memory of Yasinovets in Serbia. Their engagement with photographs lacked any serious critical reflection. Vladimir Dedier, for example, regarded photographs as an important source of evidence. In his book, Yugoslav Auschwitz and the Vatican, he includes photographs and film footage amongst the most important sources of our research. Those are his words. And he states, I have examined these photos and considered them to be thoroughly convincing documents. Yet the images that he publishes in the book to illustrate his points are precisely some of the images that I have shown him as having been misattributed to Yasser. But importantly, when we look at the kind of images that tend to be attributed to, or misattributed to Yasinovets, it is possible to find a distinct pattern. First, many of these images that feature, feature what are often referred to as trophy photographs. So images of perpetrators standing above the slain victim, or images which show the act of killing, or images that are interpreted as such. And these are some examples. These, I've chosen these images of this in my note that there are many others, but the reason why I've chosen this one is that these images, when they're reproduced in books, in exhibitions, etc., the, the captioning or the description of the image never identifies what I consider to be the most striking feature of them, and that is that they are posed. They belong to that category of trophy photographs where the image, where the act of taking a photograph is part of the atrocity itself. 
the act of taking the photograph humiliates the victim and, and, and degrades it even further. And yet when these images are shown, they're always shown as incontrovertible evidence of the act of killing, which is often uh, 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 further accentuated through the uh, juxtaposition of this image with another image that shows the dead victim. So for example, the one that shows the the the, so in the head of the, of the of the victim is often juxtaposed with the image of the of the uh, head of the of the uh, of, from the decapitation in Slovenia, so, so the where the Germans decapitated the country partisans, that head is shown next to this one to show a cause and effect uh, uh, if you like. Um, and in some sense, I think that the focus of, of, on this kind of images, so images that are interpreted as showing the act of atrocity, uh, is so important, rather, they, they tend to be misattributed because they fill an important gap. Most of the images that one can reliably locate in the Yasinovets have either been taken by Ustasha authorities during the war for purposes of propaganda or by the War Crimes Commission after the war. Photographs representing the act of slaughter which is the central motif in the narratives of the camp's history, are practically non-existent. So images from other, often undetermined locations, help to fill this void. Also, one should not forget that in the 1980s in particular, the Asimovets came to stand metonymically for the whole of the genocide in the independent state of Croatia. As a result, as a symbol of above all Serbian suffering, it began to exert a strong centripetal force to the point where any image depicting Ustasha crimes or brutal mass violence generally was interpreted as representing Yasemans. A third reason is that in Serbia in the 1980s, unlike in the 1940s, Ustasha brutality came to be seen as completely unique. While in the post-war period, the differences between the Ustasha, the Germans, Italian, Chetniks, or Hungarians were only a matter of degree in terms of their psychopathic disposition, in the 1980s, Ustasha were constructed as uniquely. One of the tropes from that era, which persists to the present day, is that the Germans and Italians were shocked with Ustasha brutality, which implies that foreign occupiers were the pinnacle of civilization compared to the Ustasha, who took great pleasure in the killings. And the outcome of this is that in the 1980s, images from the War Crimes Commission collection representing crimes committed by other forces, so the decapitations, slaughter, sexual mutilation, etc., were, were repackaged as Ustasha crimes. And in fact, I've been able to find images labeled by the War Crimes Commission as representing German, Hungarian, and Czech crimes as uh, uh, being misattributed to, 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 to uh, uh, as having taken place at Yasin. And I think another reason that has made these images so prominent in, in, in the memory of Yasinovets was a tendency towards the sacralization of the memory of Yasinovets in the 1980s and an attempt to invest Serbian suffering with almost religious meaning. The whole idea of Serbian martyrdom, the canonization of the martyrs of Yasinovets, etc., is a case in point. And given that there is a long tradition of atrocity imagery in religious iconography, iconography of martyrdom, Images of atrocity, especially those representing brutal slaying, were given additional significance as an object of fascination. So in the 1980s, we have witnessed the tendency to attribute any image showing brutal atrocity to Yasinovets, especially those that reveal evidence of brutality and mutilation. And this trend went hand in hand with the high production of atrocity images at the time. Like in the Dehir of Martin in 1991 book, against the period and taboo contains in excess of 150 images. Most of these are featured also in various exhibitions in Yasin that have organized over the years. And in the context uh, of, the, of, the, of Serbia in the 1980s and the 1990s, the excessive use of photographs of Yasin Yasinovets had a clear rhetorical purpose. It sought to capture visually the magnitude of the special genocide against the Serbs and its unprecedented barbaric nature. Individually, Atrocity images testified to special brutality. Human, cumulatively, they signified the scale of the suffering, both of which were integral to the emerging polemic about the number of victims of Yasinovets and its nature. And this then brings us to what is probably the key dimension of the usage of atrocity images, and this is their distinctly political purpose. When writing about images of suffering, Susan Zontag observed that photographs often serve as totem causes 
they act as visual sound bites around which one can crystallize the sentiment, but also create a consensus about what aspect of the past is memory worth. Photographs that everyone recognizes, she writes, are now a constituent part of what a society chooses to think about or declares that it has chosen to think about. And historical photographs, read in particular ways and often misinterpreted, reflect, while at the same time being constitutive of specific ideological agendas and political projects. They become symbolic markers that reinforce prevailing narratives and become recognizable and familiar, generating and sustaining a context of feeling and attitude. So in the 1980s and 1990s, the feeling that these images helped to cultivate were not so much one of pity or compassion that might be achieved through the identification with the victim of suffering, but they were used as effective props to provoke and exploit the sentiment of indignation, anger, and resentment. In fact, in that context, images serve not just as a reminder of the tragic past, but also as a source of effective contagion to shock, disturb, anger, instill a sense of collective trauma, and to mobilize. And the way that this was done was also through, through presenting these images not as representations of the past, but also the representation of the possible future in the context of the dissolution of Yugoslavia and the age of the minority in Croatia and Bosnia. Um, and generally, um, uh, uh, it, it is interesting that, that, that atrocity images were shown for this very same purpose uh, uh, ever since the, the, the Second World War or even earlier. There is an image from Nazi occupied Serbia which shows a group of German soldiers sitting in a field somewhere in Serbia, all attentively looking at pictures in their hands. And one interpretation by Maria Kirsch is that they were actually being shown photographs of mutilated German soldiers to, to, to basically uh, 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 make them cope with the fact that they were going to engage in retaliatory execution and shoot civilians. Ustasha during the war also published images of what they argued were mutilations of, of civilians by partisans for propaganda purposes. The War Crimes Commission in 1944 while the war was still going on in Croatia and Slovenia, were publishing images of, including the one about, about Germans decapitating uh, partisans, uh, uh, often framing them within a discourse of revenge. So there is, there is a history to this kind of uh, uh, using atrocity images to mobilize and to instill this, this, this uh, uh, feeling of revenge and anger. And this is precisely how the images were used in the 1980s. But what I think is important is that actually when we, when we look at the representations of Jasinovets, Serbia is, is, hasn't really moved very much since then. Uh, uh, it, it may come as a surprise to, to, to people who are not from Serbia that in spite of the importance that Jasinovets has in national memory and the place that it deserves in national memory, there are no memorials, there is no museum, uh, there is nothing devoted to Jasinovets. And in some sense, it is because uh, uh, the memory of Jasinovitz is, is very much frozen in the discourse of the 1980s and the 1990s. And if one looks, for example, at various speeches made by, by the Serbian president in the United Nations, when there was a debate about the Hague Tribunal, or when one looks at, at um, uh, the, the document that was submitted in evidence during the, the International uh, Court of Justice, uh, neutral accusation of genocide between Serbia and Croatia, one sees that actually the rhetoric surrounding Nassimovic's uh, 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 and with the number of, of victims and the, the language has actually not changed uh, since the uh, late 80s uh, and the early 1990s. Uh, so even when it comes to engagement with photographs, uh, the photographs that can appear today in newspapers, etc., they tend to be captioned, they tend to be framed, they tend to be interpreted, the same photographs tend to be chosen exactly as they were in the late 80s and the early 1990s. And to, to quote Susan Zontag again, the problem is not that people remember those photographs, but the problem is that they often remember only the photographs. And this is the danger with, with images when they become iconic, or even with, 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 with the, the emphasis on artifacts. Uh, so for example, certain artifacts and weapons that were used in the killing of victims are, are treated as especially important Presentation of, of, of the Asinovets. The problem there is that there is a danger that those images create the impression that the past has been remembered. They don't become vehicles for memory, they become a substitute for it. 
and then even when one looks at, at various uh, I don't know, uh, uh, internet forums where people debate history, etc., there is very often the use of these images as a kind of uh, uh, the ultimate evidence of something. Sometimes somebody will end the discussion or provide ultimate proof of something by showing an image. As if an image closes down the discussion, it, it is self-evidently true uh, 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 and it tells the whole story. Uh, and I think what is needed is, first of all, a, a greater level of critical engagement with photographs. Uh, for most of the photographs, and there is a, a complex story about the, the way that all these photographs are collected. They were all collected by the War Crimes Commission, but nobody has ever made any record about who donated the photos, what, how they got them, where they got them from. Uh, uh, the additional problem is they were all cataloged by the War Crimes Commission, and then they were they were classified, they were taken by the, by the Interior Ministry, uh, they were reclassified completely, uh, it's often they were, they were, they were mixed uh, uh, and, and, and arranged in a different order, and then they were returned to the, to the archives in the 1960s. Um, so, 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 so for most of the images that we have of the, of the, of the atrocities in the Second World War, we don't have a level of knowledge uh, uh, that is necessary. But equally it's important to, to be aware of that and to treat these images as artifacts in themselves that have their own history, that they, that, that, that they are, in terms of, uh, of, of, of historical evidence, they have important limitations. Uh, uh, and I think, I think it, it, it requires a level of critical engagement with this kind of evidence uh, 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 and also great engagement about whether they are really uh, uh, as relevant in terms of education uh, and commemorative value as is the case. Uh,